Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining today's ERM webinar on ERM pandemic scenarios, how ERM helps in COVID-19 lessons to date. My name is Vanessa Carrillo, and I'm the Associate Director of Administration for the ERM program. A couple things before we begin. Uh, one, I'd like to tell you about our next ERM upcoming event. Um, on April 28th, we will be hosting a presentation with senior ERM risk practitioners from the United Nations. This discussion will be focused around ERM in practice and key skills needed in ERM risk roles. Um, secondly, if you have any questions during the presentation, please use the Q&A tool, which is located at the bottom of your screen to type in questions. The presenters uh, will answer as many questions as they can after the presentation is over. Now I would like to introduce ERM's academic director and senior lecturer in discipline, Sim Siegel. Thank you, Vanessa, and welcome everyone to today's event. So let me introduce myself and my uh, co-panelists today. I'm Sim Sigal, uh, founder and academic director and senior lecturer in discipline of uh, the Master of Science and Enterprise Risk Management Program at Columbia. As, as Vanessa said, I'm also president of Synergy Consulting, uh, a firm I founded about 10 years ago, focusing exclusively on enterprise risk management. I'm author of a book published by Wiley uh, called Corporate Value of Enterprise Risk Management. I'm uh, also a former vice president on the Society of Actuaries Board of Directors. This actuaries are the world's uh, oldest risk profession. As part of that role, I served as the first ever chairman of the SOA uh, Risk Committee, where I led the design and development of the ERM program that protects that profession itself, uh, using the value-based approach, which we'll talk about a little bit today. I'm also a fellow of the Society of Actuaries and a chartered enterprise risk analyst. I'm uh, honored to be joined by my fellow panelists today, uh, Basil Rabinowitz, who's Deputy Academic Director and Lecturer of the Master's of Science in the ERM Program here at Columbia. Among his prior roles are uh, Global CRO of AmTrust, uh, Lecturer in the Master's of Science and Actuarial Science Program, uh, Head of Actuarial and Strategic Analysis at Assurant, where, uh, in my opinion, he functioned essentially as Chief Risk Officer there. Uh, they didn't have the title then. Uh, and I think as a current actual role as well, co-role is Assistant Director of Math uh, Department of Turo. Among his degrees and credentials are PhD in Electrical Engineering from Polytechnic, also Master's of Science Math, Math, Master of Science Electrical Engineering, our Chartered Enterprise Risk Analyst, and Associate of the Society of Actuaries. If we listed all of uh, Basil's experience and credentials, we would run out of time for today. So, glad to be joined by Basil. So I'll be uh, talking a little bit about how, how ERM helps and then Basil will, will talk about some uh, actual uh, detail and experience. Uh, first, let's talk about how enterprise risk management helps. Let's briefly define enterprise risk management. Enterprise risk management is a process that organizations use to identify, measure, manage, and disclose all key risks to uh, enhance value to all stakeholders. The value-based approach uh, methodology that I developed and it's the foundational element in the Columbia University uh, master's degree is a combination of enterprise risk management and value-based management. Two key elements, uh, features of that are that risk is defined as a deviation from baseline strategic plan. So it's both upside and downside volatility around uh, baseline plan. So it's not just loss, it's any shortfall from plan would be considered a downside risk. <clears throat> the, uh, the risk is both upside and downside volatility because you need to have both for many reasons, but among them to be able to inform risk reward decision making, you need both the upside and downside volatility to have both aspects of decision making. What, it, what this is essentially when you apply value based enterprise risk management is enhanced strategic planning, actually dynamic strategic planning, as we'll talk about. So, first off, in strategic planning, you have a baseline that is a more rigorous and detailed yet practical projection of a business by segment and subsegment. Uh, so in practice, typically there's maybe 30 to 40 different subsegments a company breaks down their, their typical analysis on. You're actually doing full on projections of income statements, balance sheet, cash flows, capital requirements, uh, actual capital, et cetera, uh, and get a full valuation of the firm uh, and also uh, project all the key metrics that are consistent with achieving the baseline strategic plan. 
Then once you have uh, a baseline, it's built in a dynamic way, you build scenarios. Uh, the first aspect of the scenarios you build is it's, you have a multi-layered uh, ability to select and, and vet uh, both qualitative and quantitatively the scenarios. Uh, risk identification involves uh, querying uh, senior executives, a broad range of people around the organization, what we think our, our risks are, and then finding the key risks. And then uh, the second level is meeting with subject matter experts to flesh out uh, multiple deterministic scenarios, uh, both up or down when it's appropriate, uh, and then vetting those throughout the organization vertically and horizontally with uh, those that may know how to enhance these scenarios. So it's a pretty, pretty robust process to that. One, another aspect of this is that it's not stress tests. A lot of organizations use stress tests. Those uh, have some value, but can be very damaging and misleading because they're not real world. Uh, this methodology is based on real world by source scenarios using, uh, developed using the failure modes and effects analysis uh, technique adapted from the manufacturing sector, which traces from the originating source exactly how it would play out in the market, how it would wash through the organization, different parts of the organization, incorporating likely actions management would take or external stakeholders may take. Once you have those scenarios uh, vetted out for the key risks, then you do simulations, which are combinations of those uh, deterministic probabilistic scenarios uh, to look at when multiple risks may occur, which is very important because uh, there's an often quoted uh, study I, I talk about uh, from Deloitte Research called Disarming the Value Killers. And it looked at a 10 year period in the, in the stock market, looked at the largest market cap drops and found that 80 or 85% of the biggest uh, value killers were the result of two or more risks interacting at the same time. So if you're not looking at combinatorics, you're, you're looking, missing some things that could be really big killers, uh, as we're seeing in the market now, uh, you know, pandemic with uh, you know, the, the oil battle between Saudi Arabia and Russia and economic downturn, lots of things happening at the same time is very damaging to all of us. But uh, in enterprise risk management, generally for an individual company, looking at combinations can really reveal some things that are very threatening to that individual company. And then once you have these, uh, the, the selection and vetting of the, scenario, key, the scenarios, finding the key risk scenarios, developing scenarios on them, doing multiple combinations to create simulations of what might happen uh, in the future, then you actually have not just a single scenario of the plan, like it's gonna happen for sure, a baseline, but you actually have uh, an enterprise risk exposure is the result, a distribution of different looks of what, how that might play out, either uh, more negative or more positive. I'm, I'm gonna try to uh, share, uh, share a, a whiteboard here for a second, just to draw a picture of what I'm talking about. Uh, so if you normally would have uh, three different companies, and this is their baseline projection over a number of years of what, they were, what they're going to achieve in terms of cash flows. Uh, if you perform enterprise risk exposure, you will see uh, in combinations of scenarios into simulations, thousands and thousands of simulations. Very quick to do this, by the way. Uh, you may find uh, one company may, you know, this is the baseline that we produced, but you may have some, a bunch of upsides. You may, have, you may have some downsides, and that may be a normal uh, range of volatility. You may have uh, another company that may be a startup, and it might be a much wider uh, distribution of volatility. And then you might have, say, utility, which is a very narrow band around that, around that baseline. Uh, this, is, this is real information. Uh, understanding the baseline is very different here. And we'll, we'll talk in a minute about um, what, what that means and how you interpret it. Um, actually, let's do that now. When you have enterprise risk exposure, you actually are able for the first time to have an estimate of what the likelihood of achieving or exceeding plan is. And that's, that's real information, especially when you do this uh, two uh, planning periods in a row, you're able to say something like, okay, um, you know, this year we actually have a new plan. We have about a 31% chance of achieving or exceeding plan, which of course everybody's very interested in. Everything is all comp, bonuses, employment, promotions are all tied to that, uh, delivering what we promised then that's interesting. Okay. And then you can say, well, you know, last year when we did this, we had a 46% chance of achieving or exceeding goals. It's like, well, what happened? What changed? What uh, business segments are possibly more at risk here? What risks are, are playing in on this? What can we do about it uh, to make it more likely to achieve? And that 
is information that the value-based ERM approach can provide. So you, you see, you get a much better understanding of what is around the baseline, the likelihood of achieving it, likelihood of missing it by uh, missing our key metrics, uh, how uh, likelihood of what we call pain points of our capital ratio falling below a certain level, or maybe getting a ratings downgrade, or falling below pain uh, pain points that we don't want to fall with much likelihood. So you can express that in ways that management and leadership can understand. Once you've established this, you have essentially an enhanced dynamic strategic planning tool, and that is how companies use it. Uh, you then have, of course, enhanced decision making. So you're able to say when there's a major change in the market or you are uh, about to make a major decision choice uh, point, you can evaluate and rapidly update. It's designed in a way it's very rapid to update. Update the baseline and then update the risk scenarios, how they might change. And are there any new risks and what scenarios might be warranted there or any risks dropping out? And then look at uh, pre and post decision alternatives and evaluate what is the best deal for us in terms of risk reward trade-offs. Those decisions may not be the same for every company, it depends on their tolerance for volatility based on the type of company they are in the culture, but uh, you have much more robust information to make those decisions. So that's essentially the framework of how ERM helps. I wanna talk a little bit about the pandemic scenarios themselves. So uh, a pandemic event, it, it's what I've seen, typically a credible, and, and the majority of my clients are insurance, but I have the clients from all, all sectors, uh, or a number of sectors. The typical credible worst case scenario, so you, you typically a range of pandemic scenarios, a moderate, uh, you know, a mild, moderate, and then in the credible worst case deterministic scenario. That typically, if not always, but typically modeled similarly to 1918 Spanish flu. Uh, and within that assumption of how that event plays out, uh, to people typically assume it would trigger an economic downturn at that level. This is, we're on a par with COVID. We're on a par with, with what, that, what that was, about 2 to 3% mortality globally for Spanish flu. Obviously, there's many things different 100 years later, uh, but there's, there's some, a lot of similarities, uh, triggering an economic downturn. Uh, also, assumptions are made about what government actions might be taken. So that's about the event itself, is imagining how this would play out in today's world. And there's thinking that goes on, obviously a lot of assumptions and guesswork, but it's rigorous because we're thinking through that specific scenario, which helps. In addition to thinking through the event, the next step is, and more importantly, how does it impact our particular company? So the company that has this is able to think through. Uh, giving an example here for insurance companies, uh, so thinking through the revenues, some products, uh, you know, life insurance, for example, or health insurance may be shut down uh, temporarily or for a long period of time. Uh, some, uh, uh, there was estimates that, well, we'll just see decreased revenue, and here's our estimates for how much revenue. Some, actually, there may be new product sales. Uh, there is a particular example I'm thinking of a client that said, look, we, if this were to happen, we actually have a product on the shelf that is of no use now, but it would be of help to people in that event and we would be re and they were able to think about that and be ready to go with that. Uh, also, there's an assumption that uh, after an event like this, of course, we've all been dealing with this, we're all thinking about our mortality, our, our, our wills in place or our living wills in place, what would happen uh, to our family if, if we were out of the picture. And so people are really moving on that now. Uh, those lawyers that are handling it are seeing a flood of action in this area. Uh, post uh, post the pandemic event, uh, these companies typically assume a bump, an increase in, in life insurance sales, uh, some temporary, some more, a little bit longer lasting. In terms of thinking through the expenses, how much additional claims might insurance companies see in life insurance and health insurance? And it's uh, uh, morbid, but really interesting to think through the problem is what would happen. This is real world scenarios. Again, these are not some randomized, stochastic, uh, you know, uh, theoretical. It's an actual exercise where you think through how would it play out. And the thinking at the time was, again, this is all pre-COVID imagined scenarios, that it would not be proportional. The, that hospitals would, would be uh, overwhelmed. People would not be able to get to their doctor. Uh, and so if you can't go to the doctor, you can't incur a health insurance claim. So the health insurance would not be proportional. Uh, and also there's assumptions of when would the government step in to cover if, 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 uh, if life insurance claims are over a certain level that would swarm the industry and knock companies out, would companies, would governments allow those to fail, uh, being a key part of the financial infrastructure, would they step in? These assumptions are thought through. Uh, many of these companies have self-insured claims on executives that would have large payouts. Uh, 
They think that through some expenses are lower, such as for low-income employees, and we're seeing that with, with something like an estimate of 20 million uh, unemployment in the in the uh, U.S. or something like that, 10 to 20 million. Uh, so that's playing out, uh, and lost productivity. That people would be home caring for uh, sick and dying. What was not imagined was the uh, the nature of the specific COVID. Now that people are you know home, spending a lot of energy just cleaning and uh, processing uh, deliveries and, and such, and hunkering down. It wasn't quite imagined to that degree. So there's always comparisons of what the reality is against the assumptions. But there's a lot of alignment with the thinking that was done. Uh, I talked to a client recently and it was disclosing to me that the projections that we, I mean, it's a little bit coincidental that the particular scenario is, is pretty similar to the, the credible worst case. Often you expect it might be in between scenarios that you have imagined. In this case, it was pretty much on target. And they said that they're working now to estimate what the additional claims will be and their current projections actually are very much in line with the theoretical credible worst case pandemic uh, scenario that we uh, we'd work with uh, on that. So kind of interesting how ERM can help companies that have this rigor and actually think things through to be more prepared during a pandemic when things are so chaotic that it's a real advantage to, to have a little bit better sense of what was expected, what is happening, what differences there are and how to adjust to that. Uh, one last point before I turn it over to, uh, to Basil for the bulk of the presentation is, can ERM help government decisions? The pictures here at, at the bottom, the lower left is uh, an OECD recommendation that I'll discuss, and the lower right is the National Risk Management uh, white paper that I authored. So the lower left, that document was the uh, Organization for Economic Cooperation Development recommendation of the Council on Governance of Critical Risk. May 2014, it was issued. Essentially, uh, shorthand says that countries have to have good ERM uh, in a nutshell. Uh, it had a three year deadline. It was only the third time in OECD history that all our representatives from all participating countries signed the agreement, which made it soft law. So, this is happening. It certainly is, uh, ERM is evolving. Government agencies are adopting at varying levels there. It is. Uh, circular uh, A123 uh, requires, a few years ago, requires government uh, executive government agencies and strongly encourages non-executive government agencies in the U.S. to, to do ERM. Uh, but it is evolving, but it is something real. Uh, th this is actually happening at this level. On the lower right, that paper is uh, sponsored by the Society of Actuaries, the Casualty Actuarial Society, and the Canadian Institute of Actuaries. Uh, they sponsored uh, my authoring a white paper on how to apply the value-based ERM approach to at the country level. It's informative for government agencies also, but it's sort of a harder exercise to think through how it would work for the ent an entire country. And the analogy, of course, is that countries don't have strategic plans with detailed baselines and projections uh, out to reasonable periods, which for countries should be decades, uh, with key metrics uh, in a nice, tidy way. There is no uh, strategic plan. There's all kinds of different projections and data, uh, but it's not put together this way. So I had to think through, well, what would I recommend uh, is, is some, some key national objectives that are overarching and key metrics underneath that that are reasonable and workable in an ERM setting that might be shared by uh, virtually all countries uh, globally. And the four major categories of national objectives are, uh, of course, keeping people alive, right? Life, uh, once they're alive, make sure they're healthy, uh, protecting their economic wealth, and then uh, maintaining sovereignty. Uh, and different ways of defining these things, and there's about 10 key metrics underneath these four national objectives. And the white paper walks through how you would apply the value-based ERM approach, how you would do this projection, how it would then inform decision-making. And what it does provide is uh, any, any major decision, like we're dealing with now, COVID, how do you handle it at a federal level, at, at, at the state level? How do, you, how do you make these decisions at different agency level? It involves trade-offs with all four of these. And we're seeing that play out right now. And ERM can help inform at these decisions. Any decision you make, do you, how long do you extend shutting down the economy and quarantining? Uh, how, how, how long do you maintain, how, when, you, when you start phasing back? If you stay too long shut down, what would happen to the economy? So lives will be lost if we, uh, if we don't have uh, sequestering, right? Uh, it, it, if we, if we, keep, keep you know, there's a certain number and estimates of those deaths and, and effect on health as well, and uh, psyche as well, uh, health of people being sequestered for so long. Uh, how you trading that off with, well, if you shut every, you know, economy say, if you shut down the economy too long, 
it may dive down deeper and longer than the Great Depression. And if that happens, people will die from that. They will die of starvation, there will be all kinds of trauma. Uh, so you really have to look at all four of these and think about what happens to life, to health, to, to wealth and sovereignty. We're seeing, do we have enough sovereignty? Do we have enough of our own materials to make the supplies that we need for emergency events like this and extreme conditions. So it, it's an interesting, horrible exercise we're going through. And I think this is something that ERM can help with even these large uh, government decisions. So, so those are the comments that I had. Now I'm gonna turn it over to Basil, uh, who has some very interesting stuff to share. Basil. Thanks so much, Sim, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us this afternoon. Um, some that was like really interesting and, and um, brought back some very interesting memories of doing a uh, um, value-based work with you uh, so many years ago. Um, I, I, when I look at this, I think um, we have a great opportunity now, particularly those of you who are um, in the ERM program or are thinking of it, this is a, a wonderful opportunity to um, watch and observe real time as we go through a crisis um, and how they, the uh, people who have the decision power are making those decisions, good or bad, um, what the problems are they facing and um, the way things are turning out. And um, I think um, when you first, when, when you think back to when this first happened, there was a lot of confusion uh, and the facts just kept changing. Um, I remember people were still saying, it's just the flu, it's nothing bad. And others were yelling, this is a catastrophe. Uh, of course, in hindsight, it certainly isn't just the flu, although some people are walking around with it with absolutely no symptoms, but they are positive. Um, it's also a modeler's nightmare. I think if you look at the way there were predictions made and um, the predictions kept changing and the numbers kept changing. And, um, all of a sudden we started hearing flatten the curve. Now, the reason we saw so much changing in the numbers is when you model things like pandemics, there is um, one key number that you need to start with. That's called R naught. It's like an R zero, but R naught is uh, how many people does a person infect? The first person that has it, how many does it infect? And it's uh, thought to be about two to three, the R naught for, uh, uh, for Corona but we've seen one person infecting 300 people while going to some function and shaking a few hands and the next thing everyone's got it. Um, but this changes very quickly. Um, and this is the reason the modeler's numbers could change so drastically, sometimes overnight, because th the infection rate then becomes known as RT, which is the rate that's changing with time. And that depends on things like we're seeing now, um, social distancing. So different strategies that go into play and, and the medications that are being used and um, whether we have or we don't have the, uh, the, the uh, medical equipment we need um, and the facilities that we need, that all affects this RT and it changes the models. So don't think the modelers were bad and that, uh, it's, first of all, it's extremely difficult to model this, but these things keep changing. So I wanna just point that out. But here is a chance as things are turning out, Let's look at this as risk managers and say, what are the problems? Listen to the radio, listen to what uh, um, you know, the, the mayor or, or, or the governor is saying and what the problems are that they're discussing currently and say, what decision would I make and what would I base it on? Ask yourself now, when would I open up uh, the economic situation and, and, and uh, lift the restrictions on social distancing? Uh, what would I base it on? And we know that uh, the governor is looking to do tests uh, and see how many people have antibodies. Uh, is that a good assumption? You could question that and say, having antibodies doesn't mean you're immune because you may be able to get it a second time. We just don't know. Um, 1918, the pandemic went in waves. There were three waves over two years. Um, is this just the first wave and those people who didn't get it are gonna have a second or a third wave? We don't know. So put those into the mix when you try to say, what would you do if you were the governor? And um, the problem, as Sim mentioned, is if you keep it shut down too long, we're really going to destroy things trem um, tremendously and uh, you have a great depression. Um, so those are things to think about. Okay, I'm going to go on now to, um, to talk about actually planning a, an insurance company planning to take care of pre-event. What, what would you do um, 
if you had a plan as a risk manager um, to take care of this. And I think the most important lesson we learned as an insurance company was um, that it's not like a hospital or the police or the fire department. You can shut down without people dying. So if you really need to shut the door, you actually can do that, which is a, a big lesson. Not everybody has that luxury, but insurance companies do. Um, I was um, I was in charge at, at one point of worrying about uh, um, asset risk and asset liability management. And slowly my job morphed into worrying about risk. There was no enterprise risk at that point. And the next thing I was filling the role probably of, of a, a chief risk officer without the title, but worrying about all the risks in the company. And um, one of the people in the health department let me know about the feelings about it. At that time, they were very afraid of avian flu. Avian flu was something that um, we were concerned the birds were gonna pass on to humans. We had seen this happening a few times in China, but it was very well contained there. Um, but it did happen in, in the bird markets. But we were afraid, particularly when the birds migrate, that they could be carrying this. Um, it's an influenza of the H5N1 type. And um, there was a conference in 2006 uh, in, in, in Minnesota uh, run by SIDRAP, and I attended that. And um, I very quickly saw the extreme risk we could be facing should this uh, materialize. I came back, I spoke to my CEO and to his credit, he didn't just blow it off and say, you know, this is chicken little with the sky falling. The first thing he said to me is, what do you propose to do about it? And we discussed it and um, we didn't have the resources to go and hire a lot of people. Large companies, like AIG and, and, and big insurance companies had whole teams that were working on this. Um, we didn't have that. And I decided what I would do is we would leverage off the disaster response teams we already had in place. <clears throat> we had various business segments all over the country and um, some of them in Miami. And um, we found that, you know, there was a, a problem with uh, uh, um, hurricanes and, 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 and uh, all kinds of weather related issues. And um, so we had disaster response teams in place. And um, these recovery teams were excellent. And we decided to leverage off them. How, that's how we were gonna plan. So we started off by making policy committees, steering committees. And um, we looked at the business segments and we decided, you know, you've got to work cross company. So people in different companies, each of these segments, they may even be in uh, very different uh, parts of the, of the country or parts of the world. You need to get them all together so that they make uniform decisions that are correct for the company across the board and that they also tweak it for those uh, specifics for each of their business segments. So you need project leaders, you need team members, you need to pull this together and you need to address your corporate activities and your business segment activities and plan specifically and, and implement these things very carefully. Um, you also need corporate policy recommendations. Um, and you have to start worrying, we'll talk about some of the policies you need to put in place in a moment, but you certainly have to start worrying about a lot, a lot of the uh, different policies that the company has and you have to change those. Um, also, the business segment needs to plan for all its critical functions. So can I get the next slide? Thank you. <clears throat> so the steering committees needed to identify the responsibilities, the roles, uh, and exactly how we were going to do this. And um, there were a lot of things that were functionally driven, so we would call them functional projects. And we had to figure out exactly how we were going to do this with milestones, deliverables, target dates. One of the key things that we needed to do was we needed to look at our base case scenario. Those of you who are familiar with the value-based process, um, we had a base case scenario, but we had to redefine it uh, based on the fact, okay, th this is where we think we're going um, with this and then work around that. Now, <clears throat> we needed to create a, uh, uh, a, what you would call a master plan and um, we needed to make sure that we had this thing continuously being updated. This became like a living document, we called it, because what, whenever there was a change, the whole thing was updated. And, and uh, I was walking around with a, a four inch binder that I was continually changing pages in it because um, I wanted to make sure I had it at least in hard copy should anything fail. Um, we needed to have a good chain of command. Now your CEO is always in charge, but when it comes to running issues when there's a pandemic, the CEO doesn't have at his fingertips all the things that are in place to take care of it. 
So there's actually a different chain of command in the case should a, pan a pandemic uh, scenario arise. Um, the roles and responsibilities of different people in the company have to be defined. Um, being that we had a health company, I had access to doctors and uh, very quickly discovered who were the, the ones who were sharp and on top of this uh, uh, issue and who could answer my questions, both medically and also on a human resources uh, point of view. And we'll see some of those that I had to deal with. Um, but you needed to have some very savvy uh, medical uh, uh, advice. Um, and then you, you had to have uh, your overall strategies, what we were going to actually do for our pandemic planning and what we were aiming to achieve. And we made, had to make sure we documented everything. Um, we wanted to also know when would a certain policy go into place? What would trigger that? And I'm going to show you a slide which, which outlines this. But you have lots of policies, but when does that policy become effective? What event in the, in the pandemic would make that effective? Um, for example, let's just go back to what we've been experiencing. What event would you say would, would have, should have made uh, social distancing uh, uh, an effective policy, um, particularly where you're being told you must social distance? And um, what event would you have said would trigger that? Okay, Would it be that uh, uh, X amount of people are landing in hospital, X amount of people are dying, or we're seeing uh, not necessarily in the US, but it's coming here from other places. So where would you actually trigger that policy? And that's what we needed to put trigger events in for all the new policies and processes. And um, we needed to make sure we integrated this with everything that was going on continuously with our already in place business continuity and disaster recovery plans so that we, we, we were leveraging off what we already had and we weren't contradicting what we'd done. Okay, next slide, Sam. Okay, um, we need to complete a business impact analysis. Each of the business units had to say what they thought would happen. And this was done on the value-based method. Um, again, uh, looking at a mild, severe, and, uh, and uh, intermediate uh, case, and uh, looking at all of those three. And um, certainly, um, here we were able to give more information about what we thought would happen because at this point we'd gathered a lot more uh, uh, um, research. In fact, I had one person within the health company whose ma a major part of their job requirement was they were doing research on what was currently happening uh, right on top of everything and, and well aware around the world, not just in the US because we knew what happened elsewhere would soon affect us if it wasn't taken care of. Then we had to figure out what were the critical business functions. Um, what are the things that you, you really have to have going? Um, you know, you're, just like your body must have the heart and the brain going, um, but if you lose a toe, it's not critical. Uh, to you it is, but not uh, to your life. And so we had to look at the critical functions that the businesses had and what the resources were that were required for them. And um, you're dependent on vendors. There are other people supplying you with things. And you wanna make sure that those who are on that critical list um, have plans in place as well and responses that they have. And then we needed to make sure we had our response plans for all these critical businesses. Um, we were also getting quests from the regulatory environment and um, customers about what we were doing about the pandemic because we were you know, like a vendor to some of them. Uh, if we were supplying health insurance, People we had insured wanted to know what we were doing if there was a pandemic, they were covered if things were taken <clears throat> care of. And uh, in fact, the, uh, the regulators um, and um, uh, the rating agencies were asking to see the, planning, the, the, the pandemic plans at that point. They were afraid of this uh, uh, H5N1 virus and they wanted to see the plans we had in place and they wanted to also see how we'd uh, actually gotten uh, uh, responses and and uh, and the plans that were in place for our our uh, vendors that were critical. So this was taken very seriously, not just by the companies, but it was also taken very seriously by the rating agencies and the regulators. Uh, and of course, there were some external stakeholders who wanted to you know get responses from us as well. Okay, next one, Sam. All right, now the communications, th these are the cross company teams that we needed. There are five listed here. You could probably think of more, 
but um, communications, this is a very, very critical. I think um, it's always a big risk because people don't communicate properly or they communicate and the messages are, are, are mixed. And, uh, and then we, we, we land up with, uh, uh, you know, issues that come from communications. I'll give you a story about that a little bit later about something that actually happened. Um, these communication team, they have to make sure they have messaging in place, both for internal and external messaging. Remember, you have uh, people who are working with you, your employees, and um, you have to be very sensitive in how you communicate things with them, any changes, uh, any things that they have to take care of. These are things that are, are uh, uh, very sensitive and the, com the communication team must be very good at this. You also have to worry about external communications um, with a number of different stakeholders. And again, this is a very critical and uh, uh, area that has to be very carefully managed. Um, your IT. IT, as we see now, I mean, we're all hooked in uh, through Zoom. Zoom wasn't available then, but there were lots of tools and we had to see what tools were needed. We had to know what software we, we could access and use. Um, could we work at home? What modes could we use? Um, what about VPN? We needed remote access. Licenses. In fact, look what's happened with Zoom now. Zoom is doing fantastically well. Uh, in this environment, uh, Zoom and, and, and Amazon. But Zoom is doing fabulously well because of people needing Zoom licenses and everyone is using Zoom or, or something similar, uh, schools, uh, uh, companies, all of them, uh, in order to do things just like we're doing right now. So uh, we needed to know about that. In fact, one of the problems I had was I wanted to know how I could ensure that I had better speed on uh, on uh, the internet in those days, that was a major issue. And, um, and that I wasn't getting throttled somewhere between a company in Milwaukee and a company in say, uh, Florida. And um, I, I uh, also want to, was concerned that maybe the internet's gonna be overloaded and either slow down or in fact fail. And um, I was able to access some very, very high uh, um, technical resources um, that were able to give me the answers what I needed, but it wasn't simple and I wasn't even the IT team. Um, legal, um, you need to have uh, lots of legal issues arise and you have to have a lot of things in place. You need to make sure you have good corporate coverage. You have to make sure that um, any catastrophic contracts are carefully worded, whether it's between you and clients or you and your insurers. Um, you need to respond to state, state surveys and you, you have to make sure when you get those surveys, remember every state has a different regulator and if you're writing in lots of states, every state is gonna be asking you for, uh, to fill in their specific form. And uh, we need to make sure that legal agrees with the way we filled it in and we haven't done it in any way that may be misconstrued. Um, and then there's a lot of legislative activity that goes on and you see laws are being passed and things are being said in, in, and uh, and you need to know what exactly the actual legal uh, uh, consequences are. And so you need your lawyers involved watching whatever's going on in legislature. Human resource, well, wow, there was a lot of work in human resources. Think about this, uh, you need to change your sick leave policy. Um, you need to make sure people have extraordinary sick leave if they get ill from it. They need time to take care of uh, uh, dependents or, or, or kids who, who can't go to school happening right now? Or what about uh, taking care of sick relatives? All of those things need to be put down in a, in a legal, um, and legal has to look at that, it has to be a document that's approved and you have to track that approval. And there were lots and lots of these uh, documents, a lot of work in human resources. Another thing human resources had to worry about was travel. They had to track travel, who's traveling, who's out of the country, who's in a different state, who is in an area that may be affected. Um, it started to become uh, a, a very big uh, um, project and they were using uh, some special software to track who was traveling and where, and people had to log in and keep them approved. Okay, um, facilities. Facilities had a lot of work to do in terms of getting guidelines in place in, 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 as to what to do if there was uh, uh, some contamination. They needed to worry about sanitizing, um, 
what they had to constantly clean. For example, they would probably have to go around constantly cleaning uh, elevator buttons, old doorknobs. I mean, any, anything that people constantly touch, they would have to continuously clean them. One of the folks in facilities came up with an interesting uh, idea, and that was if the building had two staircases, to make one staircase for going up and the other for going down so people didn't pass each other in close proximity. So they were really thinking, if you're in the facility, that you need to social distance, and uh, they, were, they were spot on. And I've heard that there are certain areas where in parks, where there, there are walkways, um, they're trying to get people to walk on one area one way and some, you know, in, in fact, in, I heard maybe in one of the countries uh, to work, walk on one side of the si uh, of the road going one way and the other going the other way. So you don't pass just on the sidewalk. So <clears throat> these these ideas, I'm talking about, uh, okay, we, we, we were back there in 2006 when this, this was going on. So uh, this is uh, quite a way back. Um, they had to purchase hand sanitizers and they stockpiled masks and those were all in place. Uh, if we'd done that correctly uh, on the state level here, we wouldn't have had the problems we'd had. Uh, anyone tried to get hand sanitizer? Um, you know what the difficulty is there. Okay, so next slide. Okay, so here you see some of the phases. Um, and I haven't shown phase one and two because that's when it first starts out and it jumps from animal to animal and those kinds of things. But the phases that concern us in a pandemic are the phases three through six. And um, phase three is when these, these uh, uh, viruses jump from an animal and start to infect a human. Um, that's the first point that you, you get very worried. The next point is when you now have transmission from a human to human. Um, and that's, that's your sign that you are in trouble. Um, then it starts to spread. As long as the spread is kept localized, and we've seen a few of those in the past, um, and it's taken care of, the rest of the world is kind of okay. But once it starts to spread beyond that, with today with air travel, it's gone. It's, it's you know, within days, once it's, once it's no longer localized, it, it doesn't take long and it's everywhere in the world. And we've seen that here. And so you can see in these phases, um, uh, if you just look at the top, uh, uh, the top bar, you can see that in phase three, you keep your normal operations going. Uh, in phase four, you start to restrict all foreign travel. Um, you start to, you, you, you know, you start using health measures, both in home and work. And um, you, if you can, you start working in shifts. You split the group by time. And um, some of the things in phase five is when you start to really get worried. You don't only split the shifts. Uh, in time, but you try to split them by location so that you spread them out. Uh, you start to use areas that were not used for office space, but were used for other things. You try to spread the office area into that. And you start the work from home plan if it's applicable. Um, you also start worrying about health measures, stringent measures. Um, you disinfect common areas between shifts. And in this case, Tamiflu was a known medication for the H1N5. It should be say H5N1. I'm sorry, we, uh, that's uh, incorrect. I think it's H5N1. All right, either way, I don't remember. But uh, this Tamiflu was known to be a, a, uh, a viable medication. The problem was that you had to get it within a very short period of being infected. I don't remember if it was 24 hours or 48. I believe it was something like that. But you really had to get it very quickly. And so the question was, can you stockpile this? It's very hard. It, it's, a, it's a medication that's prescribed. So how do you get hold of enough of this? And it becomes very short, uh, uh, you know, short supply once everyone needs it. And so some people were trying to get from their doctors a few tablets and hold them uh, uh, capsules and have them at home or, or at work. But um, this was a thing if we could get hold of it. Unfortunately, we don't have anything like that for coronavirus, although there are some things that are testing and hopefully we'll, we'll see something. And then in phase six, you only allow essential employees and management in office. We saw that originally uh, in New York, they said only those who are critical can go into work, the rest should work from home. Um, that's of course gone as much south as, as they can make it now. Um, and um, you start monitoring your employees and make sure they're well and those that they care for are well. You provide N95 masks for employees um, and you require dust masks for anyone who comes to visit the office. 
Well, of course, once everything shuts down, it shuts down. The interesting thing is that when I did this planning, I knew N95s would be coming short supply and I purchased a case. Um, the case is now 15 years old at least. And people tell me there's a five year uh, um, uh, expiration on masks. I don't know what expires on a mask, but I can tell you they look in perfect condition. They're uh, in sealed plastic. And um, I certainly have been using them, but more than that, uh, a, num a number of my, my uh, kids work in medical facilities and there's been a shortage there. And I've even had doctors coming to my home to get masks for me because they weren't getting them in the hospitals and they were on call or in emergency rooms and they didn't have the protection they needed. So the, you know, the stockpiling I did 15 years ago has paid off handsomely for a number of people um, today. Of course, I hardly need any, just one or two, which I keep reusing to walk around but I've distributed boxes of them around. They come 10 in a box or something. And the case has uh, about 10, 10 of those boxes. So that was very fortuitous and, and, and worked out very well. Okay, next slide, Sim. Okay, so here are some stories I wanna share with you. These are very interesting. And um, the first one was that when I went to Florida to discuss this with their disaster recovery team, so they put me in a room with a number of people. They told me we were very good at disaster recovery. And I said, um, okay, this is great. We sat down, we started discussing it. And there was one person there, a gentleman, who was sitting at the table and he starts to say, okay, well, I don't need landscaping to help with this. And my, I, I, I just, I, I, I lost the heartbeat for a second. I said, no, what on earth is this fellow talking about? He's gotta be really stupid. What on earth has landscaping got to do with disaster recovery? Um, landscaping is, you know, cutting the grass, making the flowers look nice. They had a huge campus in this Florida area. It even had a school for the kids uh, uh, of the workers who were working there uh, for the first few grades. So they could bring their kids to work and leave them uh, at the school. And it was on the campus, a huge campus, a number of buildings. And he's telling me he doesn't need landscaping. And then he explained himself and it, it, it changed everything. He said to me that when there's a hurricane, or uh, uh, any, any kind of weather related issue, um, then the first thing that happens is the trees get blown down and they block access to the campus. He says, we can't do any disaster recovery until we have access to the campus. So they have a landscaping team on call who comes in and cuts and removes all the trees right away. They even have their own uh, gasoline reserves so that uh, if they need to, you know, to get gas, et cetera, they've got it on the campus. But he was right. Landscaping was a critical thing. It was top of his list for recovery from a weather-related disaster. So he was clicking through his list and he started at the top. He said, okay, I don't need this. And I misread it for, okay, this is really stupid, you know. <laughs> Another thing I did is I went to meet with uh, um, big companies, AIG, Deutsche Bank. They had big teams that were way ahead of us. And... Um, this is the one area of planning where everyone wants to share what they're doing. If you can give me a good idea and help me, it's good for you too. It doesn't help in pandemic planning, planning <clears throat> if you're good and, and the guy next door is no good. Um, fellow next door, next door is not doing social distancing, then it doesn't help that you are, he's gonna infect people and it's gonna come back to you. So um, everybody was helping everyone else. I went to see these folks that were very helpful and at Deutsche Bank, I met a, a fellow who had been at what is today known as the Homeland Security, Department of Homeland Security. It had a different name then. So I asked him when he told me that, I said, what is the biggest takeaway lesson that you got from 9-11? And his answer to me was that we can't think big enough. No matter how big we think, we can't think big enough. He said, people had envisioned an airplane striking the, the, a building in the middle of, a, of some you know, place like Manhattan. But nobody had ever thought about two airplanes simultaneously striking two buildings. He says, we just can't think like that. He says, we need to worry, you know, get the people from, from, from Hollywood to, to, you know, to do the work for you. But um, it was just too big to think of something like that. It was a good lesson that I got from him. We've got to think big and we've got to realize no matter how big we are, there's bigger things out there. Um, what happened was, in fact, that the avian flu never materialized. But swine flu, which comes from pigs, um, came out and it struck in March of 2009 in Mexico. 
At the time, I happened to be at the Society of Actuaries conference. There was a pre-conference for people who were um, about to get their CERA, and uh, I, was, I attended that. And all I had was a cell phone. And all of a sudden, I had to run the company's pandemic uh, response with just a cell phone in my hands. And um, it, was, uh, it was very, very difficult. There was a lot of disinformation. We got word that the emergency rooms were not letting people into the emergency rooms. The hospitals closed their doors. People in Mexico were dying in the streets. And we had no way to verify this. Um, you may recall that there were you know, all kinds of, of rumors when uh, COVID first started hitting uh, America. Um, and nobody could get any straight answers. So I convened the team and we got together on the phone and um, we closed the Mexican office. Uh, it was a Friday, this was a Thursday, we closed it for the Friday and Monday happened to be a Mexican public holiday. So it was a long weekend. And we told them everyone to go home and stay home. We expected them to practice social distancing. Well, lo and behold, um, what happened was they went to the beach and they hung out with their friends. Uh, a lot of them, which was a total, and, and, and I don't blame them. If you have a look at what happened here, when we first started social distancing, lots and lots of people were still congregating, going to bars. Um, there was a lot of basketball playing in the parks and, and kids getting together. So there's a real educational issue in terms of getting people to social distance. And we've seen that and we can relate to that now. Um, one of the things that we got from this was communication breakdown. I, I was in touch with everybody in the company uh, who was on the pandemic team. They in turn should have gone back and informed their CEOs. The Mexican company was under a, a large uh, uh, business unit and the person from that business unit did not inform their CEO. And I got a call saying, you shut down one of my companies. Why was I not informed? Right? That wasn't my job, it was your person's job, but this was a sad communication breakdown. And we see this a lot of times. And this was the one area that somebody actually got upset because he wasn't informed. Um, at the time, this company research expert that I had in the medical uh, uh, unit happened to be in Mexico. She was visiting Mexico, she just arrived, and um, she was the biggest expert in the company on all of these issues. So she was really boots on the ground and could have really helped us. She also couldn't get any straight answers. She also was seeing these things. People are dying in the streets. She didn't see them dying in the streets, but she heard it. And the rumors that the emergency rooms were closed. She told me after, she said, I had no choice. She says, I cared about myself. Your, your, your health comes first. She got on the first plane out of there. So there went her vacation. Um, of course, the people weren't dying in the streets, the emergency rooms weren't closed, but these rumors were flying everywhere. And in fact, her being there and being the expert didn't help us at all. The last story I wanna tell you is about um, this campus in Florida in, that had this uh, large school for kids, for employees. And um, Friday afternoon, I get a call that um, the first time swine flu has hit one of our companies, and one of the kids in the school has got it, and so has one of the teachers. Now, what do you do? Here's the question. Uh, if you call up and, and let all the employees who have kids there know that their kids are, are in a situation where it's, uh, um, there's been an exposure, what on earth is gonna happen? They're all gonna panic and run there, and you're gonna have all kinds of issues from the panic. On the other hand, if you don't let them know, you're liable because legally you should let the parents know. So these were questions I had to answer. I'm not gonna give you all the, the, the situations and what we did about it, but we also had to take care of not only that, but having the school uh, sanitized and um, making sure that if we did open on Monday for the school, um, then we would make sure that everything was in place to uh, monitor this very carefully and make sure it didn't happen again. So these are some of the things that, uh, um, that we, we, uh, we faced. So um, that's it. Finally, um, selling life insurance. Some of the com companies today are now holding off in high contagion areas. Um, they're not gonna sell. Others are saying we'll sell, but if the applicant tests positive or has tested positive in the last 30 days, we're gonna postpone it. We're not gonna sell, you know, do it right now. Of course, the problem is that you can't get a medical exam. Many people are relying on data instead of an exam, but that's not clear how good that is and, and not everyone wants to do that. 
Um, some companies have absolutely no restrictions. They're writing as usual. And um, although past policies don't have any exclusion for COVID, um, it's unclear if, uh, if any new, the new policies will. Okay, next slide, Sim. Okay, so what were the surprises? Uh, um, the surprises are the, the slow speed at which the risk was actually recognized. It took a while to, you know, people were telling you, go to the parade and enjoy the parade. This is just the flu, don't worry. Another surprise was how quickly the country actually shut down. When it came to it, the shutdown was a lot faster than I expected. Also, uh, a lot wider and how everything is shut down and also how long this shutdown is lasting and I think how, it's, how long it's still going to last. Um, we were terribly unprepared and I didn't realize how badly we were unprepared on the medical supply side. Uh, very, 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 very sad that we were in such a situation and of course, the tremendous economic devastation that we're seeing. Um, I never envisioned it, envisioned it being this bad. Um, uh, you know, I've, I've thought about bad, but I just didn't think about it, that, you know, to this uh, uh, extent. Okay, so I think that's the last slide, right? And so uh, that ends uh, my discussion. So thank you for joining us. We look forward to seeing you at another event. And I thank you again, Basil, for a very interesting session. Thank you.